गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम एवरी वन वी द श्रेष्ठ क्लब ऑफ एन आई टी राउत केला इन कोलाबोरेशन विथ आई सी ई एन आई टी आर चैप्टर ब्रिंग यू एन एन लाइटिंग सेशन ऑफ सिविल टू शो यू ए सर्ट ग्लिम्स ऑफ आवर क्लब वी वुड लाइक टू प्रेजेंट यू ए सर्ट वीडियो Where you know, you know, people have sort of used robots to do these inspections. The census will be very quickly able to tell you. So, uh, very interesting that we left it for uh, curing. So welcome back to the session. Hello everyone. Myself Vishwajit, the coordinator of Sivina and the moderator for today's session. I welcome you all to our ninth webinar in the series of webinar called Sivina. I would like to start by giving you a brief idea of our institute, NIT Raudkela. NIT Raudkela was founded in 1962 to advance and spread knowledge in science and technology. leading to the creation of wealth and welfare of humanity with a ranking of 20 in the NIRF engineering criteria our institute is one of the premium institute in india now coming to our initiative sivina in which we welcome eminent personalities from different fields of civil engineering for a highly informative webinar and today it is our honor to have two renowned professors Professor Satinder Kebrar and Professor Vikas Ranjan Tiwari from the Department of Civil Engineering, Lasande School of Engineering at York University in the West. Now, before starting the session, I would like to welcome Mr. Mohit Kumar Sahu, the President of ICE NITR Chapter, for the welcome address. Mr. Mohit, please. Ah, uh, good evening, everyone. Hope you are all doing well. Uh, myself mohit sau a pre final year student from the department of civil engineering in atr raul kela and the current president of ic nitr club first of all i would like to thank you all for joining this seminar and turning off our session since its inception session ic have always strive to bring enlightening and insightful workshops seminar webinars and talk session for the student community in the civil engineering field and beyond students aiming for higher studies have always looked forward to interesting research topics that would intrigue them and also help for the development of the society this seminar is also uh, aiming to provide such exposure for every student out there having an interest in the field of research today we are fortunate enough to have an internationally recognized researcher and professor dr satinder korbrar as our speaker on academia to environmental industry transition and along with her Uh, along with her, her professor vikas ranjan tiwari we welcome you both so we have also planned a question and, uh, and answer session for the audience so stay tuned for that so without any further delay let's move ahead and hope you all enjoy the seminar moving on to you bisujit 
थैंक यू मिस्टर मोहित नाउ आई वुड लाइक टू इनवाइट प्रोफेसर सुभाजित मंडल असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर फ्रॉम द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ सिविल इंजीनियरिंग एंड द फैकल्टी एडवाइजर ऑफ द सेश क्लब एंड द चीफ पैटर्न ऑफ सेवेनर टू से ए फ्यू वर्ड्स ऑन द इवेंट सो प्लीज स्टार्टेड दिस ऑनलाइन सेमिनार लास्ट ईयर व्हेन लॉकडाउन केम टू आवर लाइफ सो रिसेंटली थॉट व्हाट वी शुड डू इन दिस इंडिया लास्ट लॉकडाउन टाइम एक्चुअली वी आर नॉट गेटिंग एनी अपॉर्चुनिटी टू इंटरेक्ट सो लेटर एंड वी डिस्कस विद आवर सेस क्लब स्टूडेंट एंड देन वी कम अप विद द आइडिया ऑफ सेमिनार सो आई प्रपोज इन नेम सेमिनार फॉर द सिविल इंजीनियरिंग सो क्लब इन दिस टू टुगेदर वी हैव जस्ट गिव द नेम ऑफ द सेमिनार द सेमिनार टॉपिक ऑन दैट सिविल इंजीनियरिंग and there after we conducted few uh, online lectures and and good thing is that we are not uh, paying anything uh, our researchers on on international professors are they are giving lectures on the research topic and uh, without any cost so we, uh, we don't have any burden on that and one more thing our student the discipline you can see that uh, this all the things is conducted by our bitech student so i also encourage our bitech student to go for higher studies so In this way, we are interacting with uh, more researchers, yeah, all India boys, as well as really uh, basically asking or encouraging our students to go for the research. So I hope uh, this seminar will help all the students uh, who are willing to go for PhD and higher studies. So uh, before going to uh, more details, uh, I am just handing over the session to our professors. Please, sir, you can talk. Please. Uh, just take a session so i can begin right yeah. okay uh, <clears throat> first of all uh, thank you so much uh, to the student committee for organizing this uh, webinar i think it's an interesting way for students to interact with the international researchers as professor mondal just said that you know uh, at least the pandemic taught us that there are other you know nicer ways to come closer and interact so without much ado i can start my presentation uh, which is on academia to environmental industry so i wanted to keep this presentation more on how research can you know take its wings and then have uh, find its way to the field application and find its way to the industry because uh, thinking thinking uh, the fact that most of you are undergrads and some of you probably might you know get into the industrial sector and of course some of you might continue to higher studies so there are uh, both these elements here let me first tell uh, tell uh, you uh, briefly about me i was born in bangalore and i have been schooled across the country uh, i did my bachelor's and masters in pune my master of uh, technology was in iit bombay and then i P did my phd in quebec city and my uh, academic profile is quite interdisciplinary all the way from chemistry to environmental engineering to biochemical engineering i've been faculty for almost 15 years 11 years i was at inrs where dr tiwari is right now and for the last 4 years i'm here at york university in the department of civil engineering and my field of research is uh, environmental biotechnology so uh, moving on uh, our our research mostly covers sustainable development goals so i am sure all of you are aware of sustainable development goals just i would like to let you know the goals on which we focus since our research is more clean energy oriented and clean water oriented and of course related to wastewater treatment so it technically covers uh, you can see the six goals that i show show you here from the sustainable development briefly uh, the research is around environmental engineering and we cover uh, different aspects all the way from resource recovery to waste treatment to bioremediation to green chemistry then having a biorefinery report approach as well as emerging contaminants so henceforth uh, we will be talking about these different themes as to what kind of research projects are active actually in our laboratory at present and of course we will then connect the dots with the industry 
to make you understand that how the research from the lab then can move on to the industrial sector. First and foremost, let me talk about emerging contaminants. For those of you who don't know what are emerging contaminants, I'll just give you a very straightforward definition. Uh, the word emerging here doesn't mean that they are new. They were actually, they are there, but their concern is more and more emerging in the sense that their toxicity or effects on the ecosystem is something which is being known now more and more. So you should be aware of pharmaceuticals and so many, we, we are talking so much about plastics these days, uh, all those nanoplastics, microplastics, when they're present at very low concentrations, we are talking here in nanograms or picograms, then we call them emerging contaminants. So this is one area of research where our research group is uh, focusing their research on. Uh, First and foremost, I can explain to you, it's the microplastic detection and analysis in water and sediments. This is a fairly new project, which we started recently. Okay, in this project, what are we trying to do is, uh, we will um, collect surface water samples from the lakes and rivers here in Canada. <clears throat> so this project is in collaboration in, with Environment Canada and uh, some of the nonprofit uh, sector. After having collected these samples, then we bring it to our laboratory and we try to develop detection methods for the diversity of microplastics that we have. You should not forget that plastic is not so easy uh, you know, to detect. It's easy to visually see when you can see those pieces. But we forget one thing that uh, when in under certain environmental conditions uh, in the surface waters, the, the the microplastics, you know, they can undergo breakdown and they can uh, technically form different shapes, sizes and types. And this is what we are trying to find here. And this data, then they, we will link it to the microplastic source and origin. And probably we will try to develop a model which can then trace back, you know, the, the concentrations of these microplastics in surface waters. The next project, which is active in our, in our laboratory right now, which is in collaboration with a professor in mechanical engineering here at York University, it is on detection of antibiotics in wastewaters using microfluidics. Microfluidics is a, <clears throat> it's a on-site detection using lab on a chip technique, where you can see here molecularly imprinted polymers are used. So what is the relevance of this project? Let me tell you, uh, it's more important from antibiotic resistance point of view. So you can see the curve here and we have the same story globally. So whatever is happening here in Canada in terms of antibiotic resistance trend would be happening in India as well. The, the very focus of this research is if we can develop a technique which could, you know, which we could just take it to the site which could be you know, wastewater treatment plant, or could be even a river or a lake, or could be even agricultural wastewater treatment where it is done to detect the, the antibiotic, then that would provide us you know, the, the required details as to how many antibiotic residues are, are being actually released into the environment. And then we can understand you know, how they can be further treated so accordingly depending on the concentration and in whichever uh, you know matrices they would be found we would be developing the treatment techniques the next project that we have in our laboratory here is again linked to antibiotic but this is a totally different story uh, just to give you a briefing here after we have been prescribed the antibiotics and we have consumed them then what happens is almost 60% of it is released through the urine uh, into the waste. It goes, finds its way to the wastewater treatment plant. And you know, being civil engineers, I'm sure you would have learned environmental engineering courses that wastewater is a cocktail of all types of contaminants or whatever is being used by the society is actually reflected in the wastewater treatment plant. So in other words, we have so many other contaminants and one of them, which is key is heavy metals. So these heavy metals, they have a tendency to complex with the antibiotics. 
uh, this is a uh, this is something which we have already proven with proven with other antibiotics in our laboratory. The most important thing that we want to study now is another type of antibiotics, which is imipenem. It is actually uh, being used as a <clears throat> current antibiotic by the uh, by the pharmaceutical industry, and there is no existing data on imipenem and imipenem's complexation with metals. And after having done these studies, what we want to uh, analyze is whether uh, the antibiotics, once they combine with the metals, do they increase the toxicity of the antibiotic in general? And, or do they stabilize the complex that it cannot be further subjected to any degradation? Or do they enhance the antibiotic resistance or do they cause accumulation, you know, because if the antibiotic and metal is complex, is it that the accumulation rate in the wastewater treatment plants is increasing? That's what we need to find out. And uh, another study that our research group is doing, uh, again, related to emerging contaminants. So I have moved all the way from microplastics to pharmaceuticals. Then we are also working on perfluoro compounds. These are the compounds which you are also aware of, I'm sure, because all our water resistant textiles, they comprise of perfluoro uh, compounds. So we are basically targeting perfluoro carboxylic acid because we go to uh, a site here in Canada where they have landfills and we collect landfill leachate from the site. We do the thorough characterization and now we are trying to uh, yeah, use the same microbial community which is present in the leachate and trying to stimulate that uh, through nutrients and study if we can biodegrade the perfluoro compounds which are present in landfills. Uh, let me tell you here, perfluoro compounds are very toxic, okay? Uh, coming from a chemistry background, I can tell you one thing. All halogens, okay, starting from fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, astatine, all of these, they have disinfectant properties and they are highly toxic. So that's why you would see any disinfectant in the market. Uh, it would, to some extent or the other, would have somewhere chlorine uh, in its functionality. So this is an important study because if we are able to enrich the communities which are present in the landfill leachates, then probably we can work around, you know, uh, some technologies for the landfill sites uh, to degrade these uh, perfluoro compounds. Now, moving on from the uh, emerging contaminants to another topic which we work on in our laboratory is green chemistry. Okay, so green chemistry uh, technically means sustainable chemistry that is trying to use. Uh, uh, less solvents and trying to reduce the amount of waste, trying to reduce the amount the amount of uh, side products that we would get in a reaction. This is how green chemistry function functions. The first project uh, that we have it is with industry here in Canada is uh, of course this was a COVID related project. All of you know that during COVID, how much sanitizer has been used by all of us. And now I'm linking that back to antibiotic resistance. You know that too much of ut utilization of those sanitizers, especially alcohol based on your hand, can rip your hand off the beneficial bacteria. And this could actually lead to antibiotic resistance to some extent, which is of course a topic to be explored. And uh, I have some of my colleagues in biology who are actually working on the related topics. So during this period, we were contacted by an industry and they came to us with the, uh, with the possibility or the challenge to develop an alcohol-free sanitizer solution, which would be more enzyme-based. So their concern was not just a hand sanitizer, but it was also if such sanitizer could be developed, which could even be used, for example, in the hospitals or even in the wastewater treatment plants. So for this, in our laboratory, we are developing an enzyme-based sanitizer and we are testing the efficiency of this sanitizer on the wastewaters, uh, wastewater sludge bacterial cultures. So you can see these two petries here, which well, this one reflects the sludge and this one is wastewater. And this you know, empty space that you see 
around this small well or void. This is what re reflects the, the possibility of you know, disinfection or the effic efficiency of that particular sanitizer. So for example, in this case, this is the sanitizer which we are developing, which is phytase and glycerol based, pH and GLY, and pH is phytase, so this is an <coughs> enzyme. And these are the ones that we compared from the, you know, this ritual is the one that is a standard uh, sanitizer, which is available in the market. And the silver and copper nanoparticle based sanitizer is also something which is available in the market, which was used for comparison. So this study is relatively straightforward. Uh, you can say we are optimizing the formulation. And uh, the next hurdle for us, we have reached that stage actually now that we will be testing it on uh, many different individuals to have statistical data. And eventually the plan is now to understand how we can register this in Canada. Because do not forget any of these uh, sanitizers or disinfectants, uh, at least here in Canada, we have rigorous rules. You know, you have to pass through Health Canada and everything. So there are some requirements and guidelines, and that may take a year to two years to actually register this product. The next project that we have in green chemistry is related to mining sector because we have a lot of mines here in Canada. So here uh, in this uh, mining, which is a gold recovery mining, okay, it's a gold mine. Uh, they are, uh, uh, they want to understand if there is a possibility of bio mining, you know, of the uh, refractory old gold ores. So technically, they want to know if biooxidation is possible. So we have a student, a PhD student, again, working on this biooxidation. So this is what is the approach that we have you know, uh, proposed to them, where we will have this very rich stream. That is the stream coming out from the gold, gold mine. And then we have this biooxidation reactor, where we have these different probes for measuring different process parameters. And of course, the uh, for us, the iron too, uh, the most important is that the microorganisms should use iron too and reduce it over a period of time. So this is what was already proven in our lab. Now, the next study that we are doing is a semi-pilot experiment for heat reactor where we have series of columns in parallel, you can see here. So it's the same bioxidation reactor, but in parallel. And we are trying to see if the same type of, uh, you know, recovery would be reported here as well as we reported earlier when we carried out, you know, the, the batch reactor uh, system. Likewise, we have a plan also for our moving on from microorganisms to enzymes, if that could be done in this case. So in other words, you can say, uh, you know, our research is mostly uh, circular economy based. So we start from a waste and then we are trying to produce different value added products and then they go back to the agriculture soil or to the soil. And then, then what happens is, you know, it can be recycled back. So the biorefinery that we have here is sort of a future bioeconomy uh, that we are proving in our uh, laboratory where we use lignocellulosic uh, material uh, you know, as the basis. Lignocellulosic is something which has lignin and cellulose. So lignin and cellulose, for example, you will have lignin and cellulose, which is mostly present in, uh, you can say, for example, rice husk or wheat straw, uh, all these uh, or forestry residues, they have lignocellulosic materials, okay? So lignocellulosic materials can be used for a different paraphernalia of products, okay? All the way, all the way from lipids to biofuels to bioelectricity, enzymes, biochemicals. And uh, we have touched on few of these uh, products in our laboratory. Here I'm giving you the example of um, and, you know, where we use lignin. Lignin is the toughest, actually, to convert to a high value product. This is, uh, you know, the biggest trouble or the misery of the lignocellulosic uh, residue that you, you can use the cellulosic part, but the lignin is something which we don't know what to do of it. 
So in our laboratory, we have tried to convert lignin into ferulic acid, which you can see here. And I don't want you to get into the nitty gritties of this uh, acid here, but just to let you know that ferulic acid has a high market value. You can see in the graph above, okay? And it is, uh, it is a, an important acid which is sought after by the pharmaceutical industry. So this is an interesting high value product coming out from the lignin in this case. Likewise, in our laboratory, we convert the lignocellulosic based, for example, in because don't forget we are in Canada where we have almost 40% of the Canadian uh, um, industry is based on forestry because we have 40% uh, almost forestry here. So here, what we do is we bring the residues from that forestry industry. We are not using the trees per se, and then we try to convert it using a yeast into you know, drop-in fuel. Now, there is a difference between drop-in fuel and biodiesel. Biodiesel is something where you have to convert the lipid or the fat into an ester to be used in the as a biofuel in the cars. But what we do is we convert the hydrolysate, that is the pretreated um, lignocellulosic residue, into you know into the fatty acids and the these fatty acids or these lipids, they can be actually after purification directly used in automobiles. So this is an in interesting fact. Now here, what we have tried to do, there are two set of these projects. As you can see, it's the same thing as the previous one. The only difference being that uh, for all of you, just to make you understand, when we have cellulosic material, we are talking about two types of sugars. One sugar is carbon-6. Carbon-6 is the simple glucose, which you know of. And then we have carbon-5 sugars. Carbon-5 sugar is xylose. So mostly the microorganisms, they can easily feed on glucose, but they have difficulty feeding on C5 sugars. And in our research, we have tried to, you know, enhance the process conditions for the yeast in such a way that it can use at least 80%, you see here, of xylose, that is C5 sugar. And this is an interesting, um, you know, outcome of this project which is, uh, uh, again, this project is also with uh, Greenfield Ethanol. Uh, and uh, Greenfield is planning to extend the, the project on, on another scale if we can go to, let's say, semi-pilot studies. Because right now, whatever studies have been done, they have been done mostly at bent scale in the bent scale fermenters. So from here, now I move on to waste to resource. This is another important sector which our research group is working on and Dr. Tiwari is also working on the same. So I think now I have to pass on to Dr. Tiwari. He will take on from here. So Dr. Tiwari, you can just tell me next, you know, <laughs> and I will move the slides. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I would just like to tell that I'm also working in waste management and I am trying to contribute to the environment as much as possible. So I will start with a brief introduction, uh, Professor. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm very happy to tell you that I hail from Odisha, uh, basically from Sambalpur, around 200 kilometers from Raurkela, uh, where the NIT is situated. And uh, I have completed my uh, bachelor's next uh, from uh, VSSUT, Burla. After that, I had a small stint of two years with a construction company. And further, I went on to pursue my research in master's and uh, PhD from IIT Kharagpur. And I'm very happy to see uh, Subhajit Da here. And now he's a professor. And many of my colleagues from both uh, Burla and Kharagpur are now established as professors in NIT Raulkela. So it's a pleasure uh, seeing and knowing about you people. And currently, I am next uh, working as a postdoctoral fellow with Professor Bra for the last three years. And uh, uh, I'm located now in Quebec, as Professor Bra told. He was working here. And uh, Quebec is, a, uh, is the largest province by area 
in terms of area, it is the largest province in Canada. Uh, in fact, the area is around uh, 10 times of that of Odisha, but uh, the population is around uh, one fifth of that of Odisha. In fact, the population of Canada is also less than Odisha, uh, around 38 million to be precise. Uh, next. Yeah, next. Yeah, yeah and uh, my field, uh, as I told you before, works with uh, uh, waste, uh, both waste management as well as remediation, and then uh, use uh, different techniques such as anaerobic digestion to valorize the waste and recover as much as energy or uh, bio resource as much as possible. And then I try to simulate them using life cycle assessment methods as we are following the circular economy as well as biorefinery concepts to account for all the emissions from the input and output of materials. And I've been working with uh, uh, civil engineering groups like the use of construction waste as well as uh, fermentation technologies, even wastewater treatment technologies to assign for all this uh, using life cycle assessment. You can follow me in my Google Schooler uh, with my name Vikas Anjan Tiwari. Next. So as I said, uh, the circular economic concept has been very uh, popular these days, and we are trying to implement in as in the wastewater treatment sector. So this is one of the projects designed for Wilde Quebec, which is the Quebec municipality. So Quebec has a temperature range of plus 35 in summer, extreme summers, to ranging around minus 35 in winters. Yeah, but it is nothing comparable to the summer that we are having in Odisha right now. I have heard from my family and my colleagues that it is around 48 degrees. But still, we have a wide temperature range. And under these conditions, you need to understand that carrying out wastewater treatment using anaerobic digestion is a very challenging job. We need perfect temperature range for the bacteria, the microorganisms to work at optimum levels and then carry out the anaerobic digestion. So in this project, uh, we had a challenge to come out with a circular economy uh, concept for the utilization of the waste that is generated from commercial as well as household sector, which is the food waste. The normal process is to use anaerobic digestion for the waste treatment as well as generation of biogas. So what we try to do is to include a part of the biogas to generate heat and power from the uh, common heat and power plant and then use it for the operation of the anaerobic digester. I would just like to add that the anaerobic digestion that is being carried out in uh, Quebec is thermophilic around the temperature range of plus 60 degrees centigrade. So when you see throughout the year, it is quite a energy consuming need. So we try to utilize one part of the biogas for heating the digester and another that can be stored or used in the grid. But what about the waste that is generated from the anaerobic digester that is the digested? So the common process is to use them in landfills by applying it to sun drying. But then we would like to include it in our environment and utilize it as a product. So if you can just pasteurize it and reduce the microorganisms or the harmful E. coli or salmonella in that, then it can be utilized as a fertilizer supplement because there is a nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium content that can be used back to soil. So if you can see this complete circular diagram, you will know that what comes out from the earth goes back to the earth. And then in case we utilize energy and then uh, re reduce the dependent on fossil fuels. Next. So this is on the same lines uh, we have been asked by with the Quebec to develop the strategy for anaerobic digestion of municipal waste as well. So municipal waste or the sludge is generated from the anaerobic digestion of uh, wastewater. And then this sludge should be or uh, is being used for anaerobic digestion. But the uh, challenges were to increase the amount of biogas or the methane that can be produced as well as to carry out more reduction or enhance the reduction of this municipal sludge than what is under the current condition. So we tried to introduce some pretreatment technology. As you can see, we tried with three pretreatment technologies with ultrasonication, biochar, and enzyme. Uh, to tell you a brief concept about the ultrasonication, it has been avail uh, uh, available in some of the uh, Scandinavian countries, as well as in Europe, even in Singapore and New Zealand, where full-scale plants are being operated, where the municipal sludge is pretreated, and they have been found to enhance both the biogas as well as the waste treatment. 
In this case, there are some of the results where you can see we are trying to reduce the cost to around $10 per gigajoule. And there has been a considerable reduction in not only the organic matter, but also in the uh, E. coli as well as salmonella content. Next. In the same lines, uh, one of our students is working on the waste that is being generated from agro industries as well as from the agricultural fields. So one of the main contents of the fields or the fertilizers that are being applied is the ammonia. Usually they are composed of NPK, but ammonia is one of the main, uh, main pollutants in this. So if you can see what is the normal cycle of ammonia in the environment, if not treated, the waste either from the agricultural uh, industries or from the fields after irrigation may find its way to the groundwater table, thus increasing the nutrient content. Moreover, if it finds its way to the local uh, water bodies, it can lead to algal blooms, uh, which is basically called as eutrophication, not only algal blooms, but increase in the phytoplankton. And in due course of time, with its dead and decaying organic matter increasing, can reduce the BOD as well as the zooplankton content and the diversity in the water bodies. So what can we do in this sector? So there was next a plan to develop a waste treatment system using MBBR, where Excel supports which is also of organic origin as well as used from one of the waste resources. So everything that is being used as a uh, substrate or as a, a support is being obtained from the waste. So in this case, the student tried to develop X cell support as a medium to enhance the attachment of the nitrifying bacteria. You should know that nitrification takes a lot of time for the bacteria to develop, get acclimatized, and as well as find supports. So in this case, the support in commercial scale, which is usually the polystyrene beads or the MBBR HDP beads. Uh, in this case, we are trying to use the Excel supports to develop this uh, attachment process. And then the effluent will be aerated and passed on to the MBBR. And then this can be treated where the conversion of ammonia can be done to nitrate and the same nitrate can be uh, sent back to the fertilizers industries where they can develop it or include it in the streams to be used as fertilizers rather than making or consuming the natural resources for the development of fertilizers. Next. In line of the circular economy and the waste uh, recovery as well as, uh, sorry, waste uh, waste use as well as recovery of uh, bioresources. One of the projects we have been working is from the use of whey, which is a waste from the milk industry. Well, as a, uh, you can see, it's written that around 10 kg of milk when converted to 1 kg of cheese can generate 9 kg of whey. So whey is also a protein supplement used by a lot of uh, a lot of people, but there is a possibility of utilizing this way if you can transfer it through proper channels to be used as a food flavor. So in this project, which was developed, the transformation of way to 2-phenyl ethanol was carried out by the fermentation uh, in yeast, fermentation with yeast. And it was successfully, successfully found that not only this byproduct was developed, which was around the productivity is four times higher than that is reported in literature, but also the organic matter contains <coughs> reduced. And in this process, we have been utilizing the brewer spent yeast, which is also obtained as a waste from the brewer industry. Next. Yeah. So it's. As I said, I also work on biomedicine. You know that somebody's waste is somebody's feed. So if you can just find the proper channel, the proper pathway to transform the waste to somebody's feed, you can give it back to the environment, maybe to humans. Next. On the lines of bioremediation, some of the main uh, contaminants we are dealing in today's time is the oil spills or the hydrocarbon spills. And in these hydrocarbon spills, we found 
four different compounds which are persistent that is btex known as btex or the benzene toluene ethyl benzene and xylene in common processes they are being tried with different chemical methods to degrade them but if we can find some ways to utilize the biochemical processes or the microorganisms into this account then it will be easy as well as eco-friendly in the same concept as i mentioned before even the temperature around canada is cold but you need to activate the enzymes as well as the microorganisms so that they will be having a kinetics which is useful in degrading these substrates in this case we are trying to utilize the heat that is available below the ground or otherwise known as geothermal heat even when the temperatures in the atmosphere are varying the temperature below the ground is constant maybe in the scale of 10 degrees centigrade so this temperature has been used for uh, heating ventilation air conditioning but if this can be diverted to be used for supplying the microorganisms and generating an environment which is useful for them to activate the enzymes this can be used for uh, subsequently uh, reducing the petroleum or the hydrocarbon waste that has been generated from the oil spills and is finding its way into aquifers and soil so this can help in degradation of these hydrocarbon compounds and we have been working this is still in the starting stage but the student has found that it can be converted to non-toxic compounds with the help of this bacteria. Next. One of the other projects of bioremediation dealing with the same problem of uh, hydrocarbon spills is with development of cold active enzyme boosters. So a specific bacteria has been found in this environment or the soil which is spilled with hydrocarbons or the petroleums having BTEX and it was developed the process was developed from laboratory scale to pilot scale currently and now they have been working in soil columns as well as tank test where they found that if provided proper conditions and optimization techniques then there can be reduction of around 70 to 99 percent and mind you that the level of BTEX we are dealing with is around 10,000 to 12,000 ppm next yeah, I will pass on to Professor Beck. <laughs> Professor, you are muted. Oh, why am I muted? Because I didn't mute myself. I didn't. Uh, you're back. I'm back. <laughs> okay. So just one second. Is it okay? Now it's visible again. The slide. Hello. Yes, Professor. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So uh, I, what I was saying is that you have had brief insight into the diverse kind of research that we do in our group, uh, which is exciting. Being in environmental engineering, you can touch on so many different topics. You know, there are so many problems around in the environment of course, all created by us. So hopefully we can find solutions to at least some of them, right? Now I'm just connecting you back from there, bringing you back uh, the fact that we have been working with industry, municipalities, and uh, even governmental agencies, even not-for-profit sectors. So it has been a pleasure that uh, many of the students who have graduated from our research groups have gone into different job jobs and let me tell you being in the environmental field then opens up you know also as well many job opportunities for you for example you can be a patents officer in a patents office you could be doing bioprocessing you could be a bioprocessing engineer of course you could go to environmental agencies you could be in academia, which is a straightforward path if, you know, if somebody is following up, uh, you know, to higher studies from undergrad and then eventually doing PhD. And there are consultancies. And of course, here in Canada, we also have a very, uh, and this is the same in India, I'm sure right now, that uh, very, you know, favorable environment for entrepreneurship and spin-offs. So many of these spin-offs, they actually come out from universities. 
And this is also an exciting thing which the students, uh, you know, who are graduating can find. And uh, it's my pleasure to present many of these students who have graduated and they, you know, they went into all these different positions here in Canada as well as abroad. So uh, what I want to tell you with this is that uh, the job opportunity <coughs> is always there. You just have to follow the path which you're following very sincerely and uh, rest follows. But you have to always stay focused on your uh, on your path, you know. And uh, of course, being coming to the industrial sector, patents are very important for them. And we were very fortunate to have worked with the industrial sector. Do not forget that being in academia or being anywhere, you can never work alone. You're working as a community. So I have my research team. The students are very important you know uh, source of information as well as innovation into the research that goes as well as we have these industries or the end users or the stakeholders who bring back the problems to us and they also tell tell us where they failed or how some of the technologies in the past they had used in the field failed so that helps us to you know understand more and probably if we can have you know we can propose something different to them so this is an exciting part of academia that you can, you know, it gives you that uh, leverage to to interact or collaborate with so many uh, stakeholders. So I've been very fortunate to have worked with many industries and even with governmental agencies here in Canada. And uh, I'm sure our research group has gained a lot of uh, knowledge from it, at least for me all in all my career. It's always been a two-way exchange of ideas. So I have learned from them and I'm, I hope they learned something from us as well. So that's how the information flows, right? And uh, with this, I think we come to the end of our talk and the take home message here for you all is that uh, being civil engineers and some of you might have chosen uh, to be probably in environmental engineering field, uh, do not forget that uh, you have a social responsibility because the society is contributing a lot when we are studying, you know, it's not only you, the whole society is working towards it. So it's your <clears throat> responsibility to give back to the society. Okay. And uh, the way you can contribute back to the society is through whatever profession you choose. Likewise, we have to have our obligations to the environment because we live in it. Okay, and of course, as an uh, you know, as an offshoot of all this, economics comes into picture, which is important because then that drives uh, the whole engine of society as well as trying to keep the environment clean and green. So uh, the research, as well as you know, uh, whatever you choose, has to always. Uh, focus on these three key parameters that is the most important thing and like i said uh, sincerity is the foremost thing to whatever you do it doesn't matter it has to be academia but can be anything industrial consultancy etc so with the, this i would for example on my side like to thank a wonderful research team that i've had in the past that i have currently who have contributed to all this mass of knowledge that we uh, we could generate in our research group it's so exciting to work uh, with uh, with you know students coming from different cultural backgrounds as well because that teaches you something more culturally about them and coming from india where we in itself are a rich, uh, culturally diverse country this is super exciting because here then you come you you, know, you meet people from everywhere across the world. And uh, so with this, I think we finally end the talk. And myself and Dr. Tiwari would like to thank uh, the Students uh, Association, uh, Mihir, Mohit, and Biswajit for making all, the, all, all this happen. And uh, <laughs> Professor Mondal, uh, you know, for bringing us here. And of course, you you have our emails here on this slide. So if you would like to reach reach back to us, and now I'm, we are open to any questions. Thank you again. Thank you, ma'am, for the informative session. Okay.
Uh, hello everyone, I am Vaisai Kumar, Sophomore from Civil Engineering Department of NIT Raukala and I will be your host for today's Q&A session. If you have any questions, do drop them in the comment section. We will try to address as many questions as possible. I can read the question. Okay, sir. So, uh, yeah, uh, our first question is from Vinay Kagarwal. Uh, as the current temperature is increasing very rapidly and India recorded its highest temperature in this decade, so what is the major reason? Okay. <laughs> See, <clears throat> climate change is happening everywhere, right? It's not just happening in India. So climate change is reason. But I think I will talk from Indian perspective, coming from India. <laughs> and as far as I can understand India, I think we have, uh, of course, we have reason for that as well. Uh, India is such a populated country. So deforestation rate is pretty high. You know, I think I rarely see how much is percentage is the forestation right now? Can anybody tell me in India? How much forest we have? Yes? Do you know how much forest we have in India right now? No? Come on, you guys are in India. <laughs> you don't know how much forest we have left? Anybody? Yes? How much forest? You can type it as well there. You don't have to tell me. Well, it shows now uh, around 7, 7, 7 million square kilometers, around 24.62 uh, total geography yeah. area. That's nothing, right? So, uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I, I had a colleague uh, who, who was doing data on forestry in India you know, way back in 2000. And I came to know from him that uh, it, in India, the forests are declining at exponential rate. Every 10 years, it, it's exponential, you know. <laughs> it's So that is, uh, I think that is the reason for the localized increase in temperatures, if you would ask me. But climate change is the baseline for everywhere. So I think we cannot blame it cl on climate change entirely. Then this is my personal opinion again, okay? Because people who are climate change oriented, they may not like this statement probably. But I think in India, having forests is very important. Trees, I mean to say, not forests necessarily. Um, <clears throat> like in urban environment in India, we don't have much trees. Here in Canada, even if you go to urban cities, you know, like I'm in Toronto, it's one of the biggest, it's the biggest city in Canada, okay, number one. But we have so much trees here, so that buffers the temperature, you know. Otherwise, heat here also increases sometimes. It can go up to 35 degrees Celsius temperature. So I hope I gave you the answer, <laughs> what you wanted. I don't know. Any other question? Do you, can you answer this, Bikash? Did you can you read it? Because you can answer it, right? Yes, ma'am. I'm reading the second. Question. Yeah, from Satyaji. Also, uh, yeah, the second question is from Satyaji Swain. Uh, as due to Corona, the productions have been heated mostly, so the global warming had reduced significantly. But why it increased? Could you give some reasons? So, so when we uh, tell about global warming or climate change, it is a cumulative effect. Yes, we did see some of the changes in terms of, uh, as we came to know, I don't have the certain data, but we came to know that there have been reduction in pollution in case of uh, Ganga and Jamuna. But these are point sources which were delivering to the wastewater. But you know, this uh, increase in temperature or the melting of the Antarctic ice 
is a gradual thing that has been happening since the last 50 years maybe so once the balance is uh, tilted it will take more than two years maybe yes there has been a change maybe the emissions would have reduced reduced okay but as compared to what we have generated in the last 50 years i think it will be difficult to take it back in two years or and i would like to tell that not every industry or every pollution generating source stopped life didn't stop yes we have been trying to restrict us that is true and there has been maybe vehicular movement has reduced but you know uh, i would like to see the statistics for the generation of waste or generation of emissions it is more from residential if you see the wastewater that is generated as compared to the industrial scale so yes we will take we will need more than that to reduce the temperature it's a cumulative effect it's not something that has happened in two years that can be taken back in two years thank you yeah <laughs> Yeah, so I, I can read the question, you know, you don't have to read to repeat so that it takes more time. So can I can I answer directly for Akhilesh? Okay. 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 So he is asking new <coughs> techniques. Are there any new techniques for plastic decomposition? <laughs> it's a it's an interesting question. Okay, plastic decomposition um, of what I know of here in Canada for example they are trying to see if it can be you know because all the plastic cannot be reused right that everybody is aware of there are different types of plastics not everything can be reused so <clears throat> plastic decomposition is mostly being done through you know chemical treatments here so far because biological is too slow too slow what it doesn't work even to to such an extent and because it ju just does oxo tree you know the breakdown of the plastic not the biodegradation of the plastic so right now they are trying to melt this plastic you know and uh, uh, trying to recover certain things but it doesn't work actually and in canada so they have they have even started making you know some bricks so solidifying uh, the plastic, but like I said, it's not easy when you have a recycled plastic. Uh, just to make you aware of one more thing, uh, which I learned from the industry again, from recycling industry, that all across the world, the numbering system for plastics is not same. So if you find a seven number behind any card, uh, any you know plastic container in India versus in Canada, what it means is seven in Canada will not be the same in India. So if the plastic is, let's say, coming from India, then in Canada, the recycler will not know what to do because they don't even know the composition of that plastic. So this, this variability in the, in the plastic components makes it very difficult to devise a specific technique for plastic decomposition. Okay. And the worst is, I think, when they break down. We, have, we are already reading a lot of things about that you know, it finding its way into the sea and uh, accumulating. That's it. So I think that's all I can give as an answer right now. Okay, Viswajit. What is the role of academia and regional sustainability initiatives? I think academia can play an important role uh, because regional sus sustainability is a very <clears throat> wide topic okay sustainability means you know uh, trying to sustain with the resources that we have in a local specific area so uh, everybody who is present in that area all the way from kids uh, to your municipal planners to uh, to you the general population to academia everybody plays a role i think so academia you can say is sort of a base or a interface between these different stakeholders because people have more uh, reliance or they you know they have more uh, confidence in the academia so probably they can then connect uh, these different stakeholders and try to bring bring the sustainability initiative 
in place, you know, in a more, um, what I should say, engaging manner as compared to if it would be done just by single, uh, single body. So <clears throat> talking about sustainability, for example, here in Canada, even in the elementary schools, you know, they do some projects with children around plastics to explain to them that plastics are detrimental. So you can understand that the child is <clears throat> very keen and curious and the child will take that information back home and this would be then shared with the family. So that is also an interesting role model for sustainability in that particular region. So I hope I answered. This is a very wide question. So I'm sorry, I just tried to take one example and explain. So is it okay? Yes, sorry. any other question? Uh, so with this we have addressed uh, most of Shivani has one question so maybe Vikash you want to take this <laughs> uh, yes uh, so all the wastewater treatment plants that have been working are either uh, aerobic using aerobic methods or anaerobic methods and I would like to just mention that uh, uh, landfills are for the solid waste that is being generated while sewage is mostly 99% wastewater. So uh, what I was trying to tell you in that regard is that the digestate or the sludge that is being generated should or can also be utilized. But there are uh, uh -huh. different, like uh, different wastewater treatment methods for sewage. Uh, you can go for ASP activated sludge process from uh, MBR based, the membrane bioreactor or uh, the anaerobic digestion like UASB, a flow anaerobic sludge blanket reactors. And there are, if you have uh, more process of areas, then you can go to uh, MBBR, just as you were seeing in one of the techniques. But there is a wide range, wide range. Yeah. Uh, land utilization is one of the, or the footprint reduction is one of the criteria that we often look in case of uh, life cycle assessment studies also. So yes, it is uh, preferred if you have a high rate process which utilizes microorganisms rather than going for the chemical processes uh, uh, to reduce the wastewater or the contaminants in wastewater. There are a lot of techniques. Thank you. Uh, with this, uh, we have addressed most of the questions possible in time. Thank you, ma'am and sir, for Thank you addressing so the questions patiently from our inquisitive audience. Now, I would ask Ms. Sivangi Bal, Vice President of IC NITR chapter, to deliver the vote of thanks for today's session. Hello everyone, this is Shivangi Baral, currently in pre-final year in the Department of Civil Engineering and also the Vice President of IC UK NITR chapter. Let me start by saying how grateful we are to Dr. Satyendra Kaurbrar and Dr. Vikas Ranjan Tiwari for taking their precious time and effort to deliver this webinar on Academia to Environmental Industry. I'm sure everything you told us today will be of great use to us someday. I would also like to thank Professor Subhajit Mandal for gracing the event with his presence. I would like to thank NITR SAC for giving us this chance and such constant encouragement to do such events, which help us grow and develop. And of course, the webinar would not be complete without the lovely audience. Thus, I would like to thank you all for attending and making it a success. Last but not least, I thank the organizing team for this event who put tireless hours into making this event possible and seeing it through. Thank you all for turning up for the session. We hope all of you are keeping safe and doing well. We'll have more such interesting sessions in upcoming days, so stay tuned. You can also go through our channel and subscribe it. And for any further updates, kindly check sestnitr.tech. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot.